Uh, hello, my name is Isis Alvarez. I work for the Global Forest Coalition. I'm based in Colombia. And today I'm going to speak about the potential impacts on vulnerable communities from the proposed expansion of the bioeconomy. Uh, I brought a video that would be really great if everyone stays to see it. It's about 20 minutes. So I'm going to make my presentation much shorter than intended so we can get to see the video, which is uh, much more punctual than can be my presentation. So, um, as we know, or maybe you don't know, in 1987, the Brownback Commission made the link, was the first one to make a link between environmental issues and development objectives. There were later the recognition that in economic institutions like the Bretton Wood institutions and corporate driven globalizations were the main drivers of forest loss and environmental destruction. Then, the uh, hopes came that the economic policies would be adapted to the needs of conservation, but th th this didn't happen. What happened was that increasingly, environmental policies were shaped by the rules of mainstream economics. And the green economy is just another step of this process. It's promoting the expansion of the bioeconomy, so expanded markets, in ecosystem-based goods and services, which, in other words, doesn't mean more than the commodification of life. So the current approach to conservation is really biodiversity and the environment as a marketable good. And mar markets usually entail privatization. But what are the consequences for people who used to access resources freely and now they are just restricted in the case of women? Women are the caretakers, women uh, take care of their families, they need wood, they need fodder, they are really dependent on biodiversity to be able to survive for their livelihoods. This is like the core for, for rural women, indigenous women. And as we know, women, I mean, mar marginalized uh, communities, they don't have any capital assets, they don't really have... Um, uh, yeah, they don't have uh, capital assets, uh, they don't have line titles, which means they must have more disadvantages in the markets. In addition, when closing deals, it is usually men that are involved, uh, usually because women can speak the language or, and they need intermediaries. So the decisions that, for example, who's going to be the signatory for uh, a green economy kind of uh, agreement uh, could also have impacts in the governance that the whole community manages. We know that women constitute 70% of the world's poor. They have lower income. Well, we have lower incomes. We have less land ownership. And more, uh, much often our work goes unrecognized or unpaid, such as the housework we do. They are the caretakers of biodiversity. There is valuable knowledge that often has gone unrecognized. At this point, I am glad that the other two um, um, uh, friends talked about land grabbing because I'm going to specify uh, on reducing emission from deforestation and forest degradation, with the, which is a scheme under the Payment for Environmental Services, one of the big schemes promoted by the green economy. And this is promoted as well uh, within the climate crisis uh, area, is promoted as a false solution. And it does not address the root causes. So it causes policies that continue promoting the economic growth instead of attacking the real root causes of the problem. Red and red, the schemes I just told you about, is the perfect example of how this uh, doesn't really uh, tackle the problem of the climate crisis, but instead it just uh, remains business as usual. So polluter keeps on polluting as usual. So, um, for those who don't, are not familiar with the Payment for Environmental Services, it means that uh, there will be a payment to a country or a community for the environmental service they provide. And as I said before, a uh, Payment for Environmental Service needs uh, land tenure rights, official land tenure rights. In communities, this is very rare. So, this is the, the biggest flaw uh, starting from the beginning. 
So the economic rationale of promoting markets in payment for environmental services is to have market-based mechanisms such as carbon trade and the uh, scheme I just explained that I will go a little bit in depth in a bit. There's also the certification schemes that we know have also had impacts uh, on women around the world and trading genetic resources and examples of amicotourism as well operating that under the premise of being equitable but often they are not and what happens if they are not equitable so coming to the scheme of red reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation and enhancing forest stocks it's a global resource based a payment for environmental services scheme. It is discussed under, under the UNFCCC framework and it has the view to reduce the global CO2 emissions by rewarding governments or individuals for not cutting down or degrading forests. So basically it means that countries in the south are responsible for absorbing the CO2 that the, uh, that the North continues producing. So polluting countries are not taking any responsibility. In this case, forests represent monetary value to industry, industries, but the socioeconomic value to those groups in society who depend on biodiversity for their livelihoods is much higher than any value for any other industry. Biodiversity means everything to them as they depend more on their non-monetary benefits. So the red project, the red project uh, is about carbon sequestration in trees, but could also, but it has uh, several flaws. For example, who will own the carbon? Where is exactly being bought? Where it restricts subsistence? And the examples that have been shown worldwide are showing this precisely. Land grabbing is one of the main points that the red projects could mean. Because the, these projects are large scale projects. These are not small scale projects. So it's very difficult for communities to engage into these kind of schemes. It has to be like a big landowner uh, that can harvest, that can grow a lot of trees. Uh, there also, there's also a lot, a lot of problems with the funding. Uh, so far, the 90% of the funding for these schemes has been uh, uh, gone to preparations, to have uh, the situation ready for, uh, for, for red, and it's called readiness. But it, we don't know what is, what is this readiness for, I mean, ready for what? There is not a mandatory red market until 2020, if at all, because it hasn't really been agreed. The EU position on climate finance is only to, to send the 20% on the ODA. So as there are no caps, there is no trade. So carbon markets are very uncertain and volatile as a funding source. So the uncertainties about the red funding could mean further indebtment of our developing countries. So we really need to watch on these schemes. So um, in this scheme, there's also a big threat, and is the monoculture tree plantations are allowed, and are also allowed under certification. And we know that these monocultures are not just promote land grabbing, but are also called green deserts. The biodiversity, the soils, the water they take is amazing. It's a big threat to biodiversity and a big threat to forest communities. And there is a bigger threat as well, which is the, genetically, the risk for genetically engineered trees. For example, here in Brazil is the biggest um, promoter for genetic engineered forests, to so-called forests. Of course, they're not forests. So they talk about race, red safeguards, but the main challenge of these safeguards is implementation. They might look very well on paper, but once you're going to implement it in a remote forest, how are you going to monitor that? How will you assure that the safeguards are really happening as they are supposed to be? There are no binding safeguards and have little, little to contribute in this respect. So, uh, and the last one is the problems for counting, verification, and leakage. So counting is really how much, uh, how much is compensating, how, how they will measure how much CO2 a forest is actually absorbing, 
What is the method of CO2, uh, the, the, me the method to measure that CO2 that's being absorbed? How will you verify it? And how do you ensure that the deforestation that's going in one place is not taking place in another area nearby or even it's far away, you know? In the end, it's not really addressing the problem. So uh, this is the Chiapas case, but the, um, I prefer you to watch the video, as the video is especially about the Chiapas case. It's called uh, um, A Darker Shade of, Shade of Green. This video was uh, filmed in, uh, uh, the, in south of Mexico, in the Chiapas area, where there has been a historic uh, problem with the government. Uh, there is a lot of problems with the uh, also with women, because uh, I mean they are really marginalized. Uh, when I, I went to see the to visit the area, and they all, most of them don't speak the language. Usually there is like one man per per ejido, which is a kind of a so so to call it like neighborhood. And uh, usually it's the man in charge of making contact. The women are really relegated to to cooking and and family. Uh, this uh, the, the picture of rural cities. Uh, so they sort of uh, displaced the the people, the community, from the forest, and they built these really lousy houses, and they just sent them to live there. Uh, and I mean, of course, they completely disrupted all their livelihoods, and the houses were so bad built, badly built. But there was even a case of uh, a person who fell because the floor broke. She, she had, yeah. Okay, so um, and uh, so this red is coming with is such a threat, and it's so important that we start recognizing it. That already indigenous communities around the world uh, are um, are afraid of what it can entail to them. There is even now a, a no red coalition, a global alliance, global alliance of indigenous peoples and local communities on climate change and against red. This was for back in Durban at the COP17 and the UNFCCC. There's a quote of one of the members which says that indigenous preservation happened for ages and a green economy doesn't work for indigenous peoples. So now I think uh, we go to the video. Thank you so much. Yeah? Well, she's telling me we have little time for the video, so if you want to stay. OK. OK, so finally, um, the alternatives or what we need uh, to ensure that the women are included and to prevent all these uh, uh, impacts, negative impacts on women and vulnerable communities, we should uh, try to find effective mechanisms at the local, national and regional levels, ensuring compliance with human rights and biodiversity standards in forest policies in general. We need to strengthen the capacity of indigenous people's organizations, of NGOs, of social movements in developing countries to monitor and disseminate information so that people is aware. We need to try to implement the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, respect for the customary rights and traditions, and including their free, prior, and informed consent. We need to recognize the traditional knowledge and its important role on biodiversity stewardship. We need to retain access to biodiversity and the environment and keep functions of um, forests out of markets, out of privatization. So in this, um, yeah, in this line, uh, it would be great to have more community-led initiatives, more community participation. Uh, most successful, there's a study that shows that most successful conservation experiences can be found in recognized indigenous lands and territories and community conserved areas. There's a proposal for recognizing these areas officially because uh, it could really play a major role on reaching gender equity. We should find cheaper alternatives that do not, in, that does not increase the value of forests reduce pollution and address the actual drivers such as consumption as fuel as poverty uh, ask demand moratorium bans on deforestation change the UN definition of forests which at the moment includes plantations also as forests 
Um, that would be it. Thank you so much.